the word this morning. She's a fiery, fiery woman of God, and we are thankful for her. Well, since Chris has already tried to use some of my verses in the offering this morning, I'm just going to pick up where he left off um, right here in Nehemiah. It wasn't one that I had wrote down, but it fits actually perfect with what I was going to talk about anyway today, which is our countenance. So our countenance, it is a reflection of our so our mind our will and our emotions and just where he left off um the people in this day what they were doing was they were reading the book of the law and they were downcast because they realized how bad they had messed up and as they were reading this law they were weeping and then they turned to repentance so they corrected the action where they were wrong and if you read on over um, it's in 9 verse 5. It says, And the Levites, bear with me with these names, Joshua, Cadmel, Bani, all those names. It said, they said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. So after they corrected themselves, they began to praise the Lord. The Lord highlighted a couple of verses to me, and I told a couple of the ladies about it. Um, I guess it was about a week ago, I was praying, and if you all remember when Pastor Jake got up and preached on healing, he gave us those 101 healing scriptures. Well, when I pray, I've got them all listed. Sarah sent that PDF, and I've got them listed right there where I can see them, and sometimes I, I, after I get done praying, I'll just go through, and I'll read through a couple of them, and I'll declare them, and speak them over me and my family. So as I was doing that... One of them, you know, when the Lord quickens a word to you, and it just comes straight to life. And it was Psalms 43, verse 5. And it says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. And the King James says, The health of my countenance and my God. And that just struck me, and I thought, what in the world? Health of my countenance. The health of my countenance. So as I thought about that, I thought, well, it must be important to have a healthy countenance. The New King James says, the help of my countenance. Um, if you look over in Psalms 42, verse 5, it says it pretty much in the same way. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Not for the help of my countenance anymore, but for the help of his countenance. On down in verse 11, it, it pretty much repeats itself. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. So countenance, um, the word for that, paneum, it means the face as in the part that turns. And it's a derivative of pana, which means to turn, appear, or to look. In the Spirit-Filled Life Bible, it says it like this, it's the appearance which can be bright, aglow, it can be downcast or discouraged. And it says, the attention, as in the face being toward, toward, uh, toward a subject, with, their, with your eyes focused on it, with the appropriate expression responding to the thing your face is turned towards. So it could be tenderness, affection, love, sternness, concern, or e even anger. So it's the outward expression of what's going on in here, in your soulish realm, that's made up of your mind, your will, what you want to do, and your emotions, the thoughts that you're thinking, the feelings that you're feeling. And it can change 
um, with situations and events, with different people. I can look over here, and it can be somebody I really like, and my countenance is going to show that I like that person. But if I turn over here and it's somebody I don't care for, my countenance is going to change. My facial expression is going to reveal what's in my heart. It's the same in different situations. If we're in a situation that is positive, our, and, and like Chris was talking about, there's um, joy in that situation, our face is going to show that. Our countenance will show that. But we're, if we're in a situation that's kind of hard, um, that's hard for us to walk through, our countenance will also show that. So it turns according to what we're focused on. So I just want to keep that in mind as I'm going through this today. And you all bear with me because I do have a little bit of scripture and, a, and quite a bit of reading. But it's some examples that I'm, I'm going to show about the countenance and how important it is. So there's three things in these verses that I noticed that the psalmist does to correct a downcast countenance. So first of all, he recognizes a problem because he says, why art thou downcast, O my soul? So he recognizes there is something in him that is causing him to be discouraged, dismayed, Anger. He, he recognizes something is there. So he begins to talk to his soul, first of all. What is going on with you? I'm going to get to the bottom of this problem. He begins to examine, to see what's in there. And then he begins to command his soul, hope in God. Hope. Hope in God. So hope, the word for that is, uh, you all bear with me, y'all child, I think is how you say it, to wait, be patient, to tarry, or to trust. So hope in God, trust in God. He's commanding his soul to wait on the Lord, to trust in the Lord, to have hope in him. And then he says, for I shall yet praise him, which is an act of his will. It is a choice. Mandy talked about this last week, the choice to praise. It's an act of your will it's a conscious decision we make that no matter what circumstance that we're facing, that we are making a conscious effort. I'm putting that out of my mind, and I am going to focus on the Lord. I'm going to focus on his goodness. I'm going to focus on his faithfulness, and I am going to praise him. And that's what the psalmist is doing in this. He's saying, hope in God, I will still yet praise him. It doesn't matter my circumstance. And when he and Mandy even talked about this last week, when you do that and you begin to praise, God's presence manifests in our praises because the Psalms also tells us that God inhabits those praises or he's enthroned in those praises. So it brings God's presence to the scene. And this is another little nugget that I love from this Spirit-Filled Life Bible. It's it, talking about Psalms 42, 5, where it says, Why are you downcast, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. For the help of his, not for the help of mine, it's for the help of his. And it says, Here God's caring countenance turns toward the one who praises. And the praiser's countenance is lifted by his present love. So it's when we make that conscious decision to turn toward God in praise that it's then God's light or God's countenance begins to shine upon us and it help, in turn it helps our countenance. It turns our countenance from discouragement, from being downcast, from just being dejected, and it begins to build that hope back up in God. It begins to build our trust back up. So when we do these things, his presence comes in, his countenance changes ours, but we have to learn to recognize when our soul is downcast and correct it. Because I don't know if anybody's like me in here, but sometimes I like to sit in it. <laughs> I mean, that's just being honest. I'll be real honest with you. There's times when it's just good. You just feel good to have a little pity party. 
I mean, it's true. Sometimes you just want to wallow in it. And you have to learn to recognize that. And you have to learn to self-correct it. So we do, oftentimes when we're downcast, we don't want to pray. We don't want to praise. We don't want to meditate on God's word. We don't want to hear anything that's going to correct, bring correction to ourselves in that area. We don't want to hear any of that. And it is a defiance of what God's word says to do. It's actually rebellion is what that is. It's rebelling against the solution or the remedy to your downcast countenance or that downcastness of your soul. So he's, he's making a clear decision that he's not going to stay in this place. He's, ma he's making a, a willful choice. He's going to come up out of this. And he's saying, I'm not staying here. So we're not staying here. That's what he's saying. We're not staying here. Don't be disquieted. Don't be downcast. Have hope in God and praise him. That's what he's saying. He's, he's making that willful choice. So a question you could ask is, Am I complaining or am I praising? Am I nursing a wound which is dragging me into bitterness or am I bringing it before the Lord and allowing the Lord to correct what was wrong in me and heal me? So I'm going to go over, Sarah, um, to Genesis 4 because that's the first place that we actually see a fallen countenance. And I'm just going to start in verse 1. Now it says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought, the, um, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now in the process of time, Cain came, he talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. So if we look at this, when his offering was rejected, his countenance fell. And just like Chris was talking about this morning, there was something wrong with this offering. There was something going on with this offering. It was not the prescribed offering that the Lord had commanded to be brought. And there was something amiss about this in Cain's heart. So I can imagine, it doesn't say this in the text, but in my mind I can imagine well, what makes Abel's offering of the flock so much better than any of my crops. My crops are just as good as any of the flocks that he brings, any of the firstborn flocks, but that was the prescribed offering. It was the prescribed offering for sin because we see over in Hebrews also that the Lord accepted Abel's offering and he was counted as righteous, which tells me that was the blood sacrifice that was needed to obtain that atonement for sin. But Cain, he was like, well, why? Why can't I bring my crops? My crops are just, I mean, to me, that's, that's probably what he was saying. And God corrected that attitude in him. He corrected that attitude in him. Why is your countenance fallen? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? If you obey my commandments, won't you be also accepted? But in this story, Cain, he does not self-correct. He takes that wound, 
instead of coming into that correction and coming into obedience to what God had told him to do, he takes that and he nurses it. Well, I can't believe that he just wouldn't accept my offering. He just continues to dwell on that. Um, he just continues to nurse his own wound, how he was wrong, refusing to take a look at, at his own heart, and eventually it, it led him to kill his brother. It, it led him to kill his brother. So Cain's countenance was fallen. So in turn, now his brother's dead. So now his countenance being fallen has led to that. And not only now is his countenance fallen and he's cursed, but now Adam and Eve have lost a son. The other one's cursed. So now not only is Cain's countenance fallen, their countenance, I'm sure, is fallen. So not only did his fallen countenance affect him, but it affected the other people around him, surrounding him. Because sin, it's something that the Lord, it never stays small, but it always seeks to infect all those around you. So now I want to look over at 1 Samuel. And I think I'm going to start in verse 4. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And isn't it just like the enemy to find that one spot, that one thing, that one thing that you're struggling with and just to poke you there and just to keep poking and to keep prodding. So it said she provoked her severely and made her miserable. And so it was year by year. She didn't just do this one time. She continually reminded Hannah that she did not have a child. Continually. So the enemy was using her to continually provoke her right there. So when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. That is a fallen countenance. That is what is that sadness, that downcastness going on inside of her coming to the forefront. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So her fallen countenance is now also affecting her husband because he's like, I'm so good to you and nothing I'm doing is, is cheering you up. So Hannah arose after they finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. And now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. And now Hannah spoke only in her heart, so only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So her face at this point, she was in such bitter anguish that her face, her countenance showed what she was feeling inside, so much so that he thought she was drunk. He thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. So she had been telling the Lord her complaint repeatedly 
her complaining and grieving, her complaining and grieving. So she was distressed. So if you are continually telling the Lord about your complaint, you're not giving him any praise, nor is that, that is the opposite of trust. So here she, she is downcast. She is downcast. And then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. So Eli is going to, that he's been in the presence of the Lord, and he is going to reflect that countenance of God, God's countenance is onto Hannah. And he, that is the hope that she needs. He's restoring her hope and trust in God right there when he says, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked for, of him. And she said, Let your maid servant find favor in your, in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So right then she decided, You know what? I'm, I'm not going to stay here. He's just reminded me to have hope in God. He's just reminded me that God fulfills his promises. And I'm going to cling to that. I'm going to hold on to that. So she gets up, she goes and eats, and her face was no longer sad. It changed her whole demeanor. And then watch what she does. Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped, the, and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So after she got out of that complaining, that downcastness of spirit, she allowed the Lord to reflect his countenance upon her. Her face was no longer sad. She put off all of that downcastness, that discouragement, everything that looked to be contrary to what the Lord had promised. She decided to grab a hold of hope. She decided to renew her trust in God. And she came to a place where she was no longer had a sad face and she began to worship the Lord. And it's when she done that that the promise was fulfilled in her life. Because the enemy, he will come in and he will repeatedly attack. That's what he loves to do. He will repeatedly attack. He comes to wear out the saints of the Most High God. And that's one way he does it. He picks, he picks, he prods. And he constantly reminds you that things in the natural do not look anything like what God has promised. But she had to be reminded of that. And she had to renew her trust in God. So we're going to go on over to 1 Samuel. We're going to look at another instance. Chapter 17. And we're going to look at what happens with David and Goliath, especially um, in how someone's countenance can affect a lot of other people. Sarah, I think I'm going to start in... Verse 3. I'm going to skip around a little bit so it won't be so long. So the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath. So that champion was actually a middleman. They didn't want to have to send all of their soldiers out and everybody fought. So they sent out what was called a champion. And that one person, one side would send out their champion, another side would send out their champion. And whoever won that battle would determine how the whole battle went, the outcome of the whole battle. So it says that his height was six cubits and a span, which is like nine foot, nine inches. So that's He's pretty big. He's pretty tall. <laughs> he, he wasn't short. <laughs> Let's put it like that. And he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's like 126 pounds. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the, the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, which is like 15 pounds, and a shield bearer went before him. I don't know about you all, but he's pretty intimidating to me just reading about him right there. Yeah. 
very intimidating to me. And then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel. And he said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So automatically they allowed what was going on in the natural to affect their soul, their emotions. They were in fear. They were in doubt. They were in distrust of God. And verse 16 says that the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. So he came out and taunted them 40 days, morning and evening. Morning and evening. Morning and evening he came out and taunted and threatened them and just drove home that sense of fear, that sense of intimidation, that sense of you're never going to win this battle, this obstacle's not ever going to be moved. He, that's just like the, Satan does that. He does that all the time. He comes out as long as you allow him to come out and just say, you're never going to overcome this. You're never going to do any better. You're never going to come out of this place. You're never going to see the fulfillment of a promise. That is, he wants you to believe that. He wants you to be in that doubt, in that distrust of the Lord. Because when he gets you in that doubt and that distrust of the Lord, he's already won his battle. He, he doesn't have to do anything else. He doesn't have to put anything on you. He doesn't have to do anything because you have already ruined yourself when you allow him to do that. When you allow him to get you into that place, he doesn't have to do anything else. It was those repeated taunts over and over and over, wearing them down, wearing them down, wearing them down. And then they begin to talk and chatter amongst themselves. I mean, who is this Philistine? Look how big he is. Can you imagine? I mean, just put yourself in this position. You know what you would hear if you would go around the camp. Look at this Philistine. He's so tall. His coat of mail is 126 pounds. His uh, spearhead is 15 pounds. He's, he's almost 10 foot tall. Who can, who can defeat him? You know what the chatter would be. All the disbelief and the chatter. You know how that would be. So let's skip on down to verse 23. And this is David. He's came in to bring his brother some food. So then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the army of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words that he had been taunting them with two times a day for 40 days. And David heard them. David heard them. So there's an opportunity for David in his own mind, in his own flesh, in his own emotions, to react the same way that everybody else in the army of Israel had reacted. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him, and they were dreadfully afraid. So that the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. And then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So there was something inside David that refused to react the same way as the entire army of Israel was reacting to this Philistine when he came out. David had been in the presence of something other than fear and intimidation. David had been out in the sheepfold in the presence of God, praising him, worshiping him, just dwelling in his presence. And as he has dwelled in that presence in the sheepfold taking care of the sheep, the presence, the countenance of God had come upon him to where he had, he had fortified himself in hope 
and trust in the Lord. So when he looked at this Philistine out in the field, he recognized he doesn't have a covenant with God. Who is he that he should defy the armies of Israel? He doesn't have a covenant with God. Who is he? So that rose up in him, that steadfastness, that firmness, that where he had prepared himself out in that sheepfold. So the enemy couldn't get to David by all the chit-chat, the chatter that was going on. And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him towards another and said the same thing. And the people answered him as the first ones did. And now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. So isn't it just like the enemy? If he can't catch you up in one area, if he can't catch you up over here, he's going to come over here. And this time with somebody closer to you. This time was somebody closer to you to try to get you intimidated, to try to get you in doubt, to try to get you to distrust what the Lord has spoken to you, to try to make your countenance downcast because that will prevent the promise of the Lord working in your life. So he uses his brother, and from what I can judge by this passage, this was probably not the first time his brother had belittled him. Probably not the first time. So I'm going to skip on down to verse, I think it's 51, Sarah. He goes to Saul. Saul wants him to put on his army or his armor. And he's like, this, this isn't working. This isn't going to fit. Um, I, I'm, I can't do it with this on me. It doesn't fit me. And he picks him out five smooth stones. And he gets his sling. And then he goes out to the valley. Because David had learned more than how to use a sling and a stone while tending, that, while tending the sheep. That's how he was able to fortify himself enough to go out there. He had learned to trust in the Lord. He had been in the presence of the Lord enough. He would learned how to encourage himself and to trust in him. So it says, Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine. This is after he sunk his stone in his head. Took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him. And caught, cut off his head with it. And the Philistines saw that their champion was dead. They fled. Now they're the ones that's downcast. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted. And pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell among the road to Saram, even as far as Gath and Ekron. So as when, after David slew him, that changed the whole um, spirit of the, of the Israelite army. They were no longer downcast. They were no longer intimidated. But now they were given a shout of victory up in the camp. So his, his ability to fortify himself in the Lord and to keep his soulless realm from being downcast and to keep his trust in God turned the entire Israelite army. It turned their countenance. It turned how they thought. It turned what they saw. So he shifted that, that whole atmosphere because he had allowed the presence of God, the countenance of God to shine upon him. And in turn, he reflected that because the Bible says in his light, we see light. So as God's light had shone upon him out in the sheep field, he in turn shined that light out and used it in a mighty way to turn that whole battle into a victory. So I'm going to go on over to Matthew 26. And this is Peter and Jesus. 
because there's also a time of preparation that we have. And prayer is the place of preparation. So I'm going to start, Sarah, in verse 31. And Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be a, I'll never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all of the other disciples. So there's something here with Peter that Jesus has given him a warning, and he can't see it. I love how the Amplified Classic phrases this verse, so I'm going to read it out of there, Sarah. It says, Peter declared to him, Though they all are offended and stumble and fall away because of you, and distrust and desert you, I will never do so. There is a boastfulness and arrogance in Peter's attitude. I mean, he's arguing with Jesus. Jesus said, most assuredly, this is going to happen. And Peter is like, no, not me, Lord. No, not me, Lord. Not, not this old boy right here. Not going to happen. And I don't know, I mean, if you've ever, you know, the Lord's ever tried to warn you, and you kind of get into a back and forth with him, the Lord's like, he's telling you, prepare yourself. You need to prepare yourself. You need to prepare yourself. There's something, there's something you need to recognize right here. You need to prepare yourself for what's going to happen. Right. He's saying to Peter, you're going to lose hope in me. The hope you had in me as, I, as the Messiah, you're going to lose that. It's going to bring a distrust right there. And Peter didn't recognize that. And I don't know if it was maybe his arrogance and pride to a certain extent that blocked him and kept him from recognizing that. But you know, when we fall into certain areas... It keeps us from hearing from God the way that we should hear from him. So on over, we're going to start back in 36. And then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So we can even see right here Jesus is dealing with his soulish realm. He, he, he's having to deal with the same thing that we deal with. He was tempted in like manner, just like we are. And he is, he's deeply distressed and sorrowful, and he is having to deal with this. And he came to them and he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. So he's telling them, Be alert. St pray with me. Just just stay and watch with me here. And he went a little farther, and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And that is where Pastor Jason, it has always stuck with me. He talks about prayer being the place of the great exchange. And I'll always think about that because you come in and that's your soulish realm, what you want, your desires, your will. And because Jesus didn't want to die on the cross, but he knew that that was the Father's plan for him. So he had to bring that soulish realm of himself into subjection with what he knew that God had intended for him, the cup that he would have him drink. And he had to exchange that. He had to say, God, I really don't want to do this, but yet I'm going to still say yes to you. And as he's praying, I can imagine he's asking the Lord to empower him to make it, make it through that. And he's exchanging that. And as he's exchanging that and being obedient to what the Father wants, then the grace of God's able to come in and allow him to overcome those things. But he came back to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? You couldn't even watch with me one hour. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. 
For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That flesh that you have to, you have to rule over. That way it doesn't overtake you like it did Cain. Those emotions you have to rule over so they don't overtake you like they did Cain. Those thoughts you have to rule over and cast down so they don't overtake you. Those decisions when you want to go one way but the Lord's wanting you to go another that you have to rule over that way they don't overtake you. And he's telling Peter, watch and pray. You need to pray. You need to be prepared. And again a second time he went away and prayed saying, Oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, Unless, or well, it cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. They were, they were comfortable. They were comfortable in the spot that they were in. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. He's saying, don't worry about praying now, because the hour's already here. The thing I've been warning you about is already upon you, and you're not prepared. You didn't do the preparation. You didn't exchange all of those soulish feelings, all of those soulish thoughts, all of that will, your own will. You didn't exchange that in prayer. And now the hour for you to be tempted is here. Jesus, and he had to go more than once into prayer and submit himself to the Lord. Three times, three times he went into prayer and submitted his will to the Lord. Three times. So sometimes when you go in the first time, you may need to go back in again. You may, you may see some of those same things starting to creep back up. And you may need to go back into your place of prayer again and fortify yourself again. And you may need to do it a second time. And you may need to do it a third time. How many ever times it takes. But you may need to go back in and, and continue to fortify yourself. So prayer is what sustained Jesus to endure what, he, what was before him, the cross. The exchange of his will for God's and the lack of prayer is what caused Peter to stumble or to be mistrustful of who Jesus was. Tempted to return to what he knew, his old ways, his old patterns, that same cycle that he had been in before. And prayer is what prepares you for the onslaught of the enemy when he comes against our soul, when he comes seeking those places that he sees weakness in us. It allows our spirit to be built up. It allows our hope in God to be firmly established. And it allows the Holy Spirit to speak to us and pinpoint areas that need a little bit of work, areas where we have a tendency to yield over to our flesh. So let's go on over to verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. So notice, you know, Peter is one who was stuck to Jesus like glue. And now he's following him at a distance. So already he, he, he hasn't prepared himself. So already here he is. He's backtracking a little bit. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. And now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. And even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. On down, let's go on down to 69. And now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. So right there, when the temptation came, that fear of man, that snare, he, he, he was not able to overcome it because he had not fortified himself. 
And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him, and she said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, or the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Because he had not been in the place of prayer and preparation, now he's downcast. Luke, it talks about, as that rooster crowed and Peter denied him, Jesus looked over and his gaze pierced him. Now his soul, his emotions, I mean, he's distraught and he is weeping bitterly, bitterly. And this could have derailed Peter's whole ministry if he would have allowed it to. It could have derailed Peter's whole ministry. Um, it could have derailed Peter being the rock that the church was built upon. So we're going to go on over to John 21. Because there comes a point, if you say enough's enough, there's a point of restoration for you. We're going to say, uh, start in verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Can you imagine after you've denied Jesus three times and him coming to you and him saying, do you love me more than all these disciples? I mean, man, I would be tempted to be like just wanting to go hide in the corner, <laughs> you know, because Jesus knows he's denied him. Jesus knows he's denied him. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And I would assume at this point that that pridefulness that was in Peter before when he was like, I'll never deny you, I'm going to assume that that's pro it's, it's pro he's probably recognized that now and dealt with that. And I'm going to say this is a humble spirit when Peter's like, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then he said to him, feed my lambs. So he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. It was never a question of Peter's love toward Jesus that was in question. Jesus knew that Peter loved him, but Peter had not prepared himself. And we have to be able to pinpoint those things in our soulless realm, to be able to weed those out, to be able to recognize them, and to be able to correct them in order to be prepared for the things, the obstacles that we face. So he said, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And, what he had spoke, and when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And on down through here, Peter wants to ask about the other disciple. And Jesus corrects him again. He said, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. He's reminding him, Peter, you keep your eyes on me. You keep your focus on me. You don't worry about anybody else. You don't worry about what this one over here is doing. You don't worry about what I've told that one back there to do. You focus yourself on me and what I've asked you to do. You stay focused. You focus yourself on me and what I've asked you to do. The Bible says, though a righteous man falls... Seven times they rise again. So it's your decision. You can sit in that place of a downcast spirit, a downcast countenance. You can waller there. You can just rehearse all of your problems, all of the wrongs that's been done to you, all the things that's not going right. Or you can make a choice 
to get up and strengthen yourself in the Lord. You can make a choice to continue to pray. You can make a choice to continue to praise. You can make a choice to renew your hope, your trust in the Lord. And you can come out of that. Restoring Peter's hope in him and extending forgiveness to cover that shame and guilt that he felt. So even if you're in that place of error, there is restoration with repentance. When you repent and you come back in and you say, Lord, I've messed up. I've missed it here. Help me. Show me exactly what it was that caused me to miss your will for my life. Show me exactly what it was that caused me to miss it, to cause me to go off the rails a little bit. Show me what it was so I can correct it. He is faithful. He is faithful to show you where it's at. It was Jesus allowing the light of his countenance to change Peter's and restoring his soul back to a place, a right place, so he could be useful for the ministry. Because it's when we allow our soul to override our spirit, it affects everything. It derails us, it derails other people, it derails God's plans and purposes, and it hinders how effective we are in the kingdom of God. Uh, Leslie reminded me of this, this verse this morning, and it's Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 in the Amplified Classic. It says, when angry, when angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, or your indignation last until the sun goes down. That means deal with your issues. Deal with your issues right then. Learn to recognize them. Learn to recognize when they're creeping up and deal with them right then. Leave no such room or a foothold for the devil. Give no opportunity to, opportunity to him. Because that foothold she was talking about was a place in which to progress in battle. And when you give him a foothold, he has a secure place to advance in your life. Those things that you do not deal with, that you let go unchecked in your mind, the thoughts, in your emotions that you do not, you don't get a grasp on, you don't get them under control. In your will, when you're wanting to do one thing, God wants you to do another. When you don't bring those things into subjection to Him, when you're not producing fruit of the Spirit like Chris was talking about this morning, but you're over in the works of the flesh... Those things are going to derail you because he has a place in you. He has, you're not abiding on the vine and you're not bearing the fruit. You're abiding over here. You're giving him a place, a foothold. And it's when we bring ourselves into subjection of that, just like Chris was talking about, in his presence is fullness of joy. Even when it's in correction, when he's bringing correction, in that place is joy because he's putting you back on a right path. He's saying, hey, I love you, and I don't want you over here in this mess. I don't want you over here in this mess. He's bringing you back into a right place where you can be useful, where you can be joyful, where, you can, where, where there'll be nothing hindering you, weighing you down. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That, I, I wrote that down as he was closing his sermon because in his presence is fullness of joy and the joy of the Lord is our strength. That countenance, his light, it strengthens us. It strengthens us. It illuminates things that are wrong. So that's really, I hope that made sense to you all. But that his countenance, that stuck with me so much. His countenance. And I, I kind of went back and forth about this this morning. Um, and I didn't really know if I wanted to get up here and tell this, especially because I didn't, I didn't even ask Neil about it. But I think I'm going to because I think it ties it together. Um, and there's a couple of you women maybe that I talked to about it. But you all know, like as far as our marriage, there was hardly no hope in my heart for a reconciliation of that. At one time, I was downcast in my countenance about this. And it's something I'd been praying for for a long time. But in the place of prayer, the Lord began to deal with me, not about him, but he began to deal with me about me. Because that's also what happens when the place of prayer, God's not going to deal with you about this person over here. He's going to deal with you about your own heart. So I had to correct those things in my own life. 
And then I had to let God's presence or God's countenance shine upon me and correct my countenance. And in turn, when I corrected my countenance and it shifted towards him, then in turn his countenance changed towards me. But it's a lot of times not until you do the things that you need to correct within yourself that the countenance of other people will change towards you. And I'll just say, you know, the Lord even worked a miracle that I didn't even think was possible in our marriage. So don't give up hope. And don't be discouraged because you're being corrected. If you're being corrected, the Lord is shining his love upon you. He's shining, your, he's, he's shining his love upon you because he wants you in a place of right standing with him. Correction is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. You got anything? So as she started on that, yeah. Thank you, you Miss Amy. As she started on that this morning, it reminded me yesterday I was studying some last minute things for last night, you know, we had a class on internet and online safety and protecting our children because our children, you know, and even us can be exposed to things and can see things and can get things down inside of us through our eyes and through our ears, what we listen to can get things down inside of us that can also affect our countenance, can affect, it can affect our spirit and our soul and can, we can be tormented. If we let fear in our house through our eye gate or our ear gate, if we let that fear in, that can affect us. And as I was studying for that class last night where we talked about some ways to safeguard your children if you're going to let them on the internet and places, you know, and ways that you can, you know, keep the guardrails up where they can and can't go and things that they do and don't need to be doing and ways to train them up. As I was studying that, um, I, look, I was looking at Matthew 6, verse 22. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is sound, your entire body will be full of light. And in the, the new Amplified, not the Amplified Classic, the new Amplified says, so if your eye is, is healthy or spiritually perceptive, in the, in the new Amplified says that there. Um, the Amplified Classic says, if your eye is sound... But what really struck me, I got to thinking about the eye is the lamp of the body. And if you think about lamps, you know, we had Tommy Chamberlain come a couple of years ago when we did that Destination Dig VBS, you know, all about archaeology. And Tommy Chamberlain, he's a, uh, he's a lawyer in Pikeville, but he also goes to Shiloh in Israel and he does archaeological digs. So they dig there. And one of the things that they bring back a ton of, and he always has them to show us, are the little lamps that you can hold in your hand. You know, they're just about this size. And they would be the lamps that they would carry around their house or they would sit next to them if they're reading or while they're cooking or something like that, that little lamp. And with those little lamps, what you would do is, is they kind of look like a tiny, to me they look like a tiny, more shallow teapot. You know, so they got a big hole in the middle, and they have, they have a little tube kind of that comes up like a teapot does. And you would light the end of it over here, and it would burn whatever is in the big pot, whatever's in that reservoir. So you'd pour your oil in the reservoir, and it would draw up through that tube, and it would, and it would light. And that made me think about the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eyes are dim and your eyes are downcast, that countenance that Amy's talking about, if your eyes are dim, then you have to look at what is the oil coming out of my spirit and my soul. What is the oil that's being burned in those lamps? If your eyes are burning bright... Then it says in verse 23, it says, But if your eye is unsound, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the very light in you, I'm in the Amplified Classic, Sarah. If the very light in you, your conscience is darkened, how dense is that darkness? 
How dense is that darkness? So what we're putting in, what we're filling ourselves with will light up through our eyes. And through those eyes, the, I believe the NLT says if your eyes are healthy, if your eyes are healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. So whatever's burning through your eyes, through that lamp, is the light back to your body. That, I mean, it's basically health to your body. That light, where that light is, it dispels the darkness. And so that, that hit last night, especially as we were talking about ways to protect what is going into your body and what's going into your kids' bodies through the eyes and the ears is what we were talking about last night. Um, and so that can affect your countenance. And those things will affect your health. Not just your soulish health, not just your spiritual health. They will affect your physical health. They will affect your physical health when you are downcast. <clears throat> but I especially, just as we're wrapping up, I thought it, it's very interesting how this scripture, verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body, that is right in the middle of a whole passage about who we serve. Who we serve. And so in verse 21 it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What are you treasuring all the time? You know, not just your, your, your financial treasure, but what do you treasure? What do you hold dear? dear? What are you focusing on? You know, does the music that you listen to, do the movies that you watch, the television shows that you watch, do those mean more to you to put those in your body than what putting in the focusing on God, focusing on Him, serving Him, what He wants for you, what He's teaching you, what He's telling you, spending your time on that and focusing on Him, is that more important? Because then right after, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be, it says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So whatever you're treasuring and putting in is what's going to give light back through those same eyes that took in whatever it is that you chose to take in. And it goes on in this same chapter to talk about you can't serve two masters if you serve you can serve God or you can serve mammon, greed, the love of money, or you can serve God. We can serve God with our money and He will richly bless us, or we can serve money and we can strive for it. And if, I don't know if you've ever met a greedy person before, but a greedy person who is striving for money and loving money, and that's what their focus is on is that, and they're greedy and they're, and they're gripping onto it, I don't know how many of them you've ever met that have had a really good countenance. Most greedy people that I ever meet are pretty downcast or pretty grumpy or grouchy. They're tight-fisted. They're just everything. And then they usually don't have a real good spirit life. Their soul is spewing out all kinds of nastiness. And then nine times out of ten, they don't have a really good physical health as well. Eventually it catches up with them, doesn't it? And so you think about it, it's all right there together. It's right smack in the middle. It's right smack in the middle of, of what it's telling us to focus on and who we serve. It's right there. And so, you know, if you've got that stuff down in there that you've let in or that you have taken in or that you hold dear and those are the things that are affecting that countenance and that's what Amy was teaching us this morning is we've got to examine those things, look at those things. I love it when she started out in Psalms, Oh my soul, why are you downcast? Don't start with, What did my kids do today that put me in a bad mood? What did my coworkers do today that put me in a bad mood? What did Leslie say today that put me in a bad mood? No. Oh my soul, why are you downcast? What's your problem? Like, you, like what, what's your deal? What's your deal? Looking at that, so again, thank you, thank you for that this morning, Amy. I think that's it's it's critical for where where we are and where we're headed. And so, um, you know, let let's examine that. Everybody, let's stand up.
as we get ready to dismiss. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the light that your word brings. We thank you that your, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you for this word that we've received today, God. We just ask right now that you would help us to illuminate those things. Continue to help us to find those things and to examine those things. If we allow our countenance to be dimmed by those things, that you would illuminate those to us, that you would highlight those things, that we can burn those things out, that we can give those things over to you, that you can help us to get rid of those out of our lives, that we could focus on you, focus on serving you, God, and focus on the light that you bring to us. We want the light that comes forth from us to be the light that shines from your spirit and shines from your spirit in us. Help us, Holy Spirit, to highlight those things, to examine those things. We give you permission today, Lord. I give you permission in my, my soul, in my body, in my spirit to examine those things and find those things out and to highlight those to me, God that I can deal with those, that I can hand those over to you. And I commit myself to focusing on you and focusing on your word and focusing on your will as we go forward. Hallelujah. We give you praise and honor and glory for everything that you've done today, every word that you've brought to our hearts, every word that you've brought to our minds, and everything that you're doing in and through us now. We give you the glory and the honor for it. As Pastor Manny and Jason... Get ready to minister in South Dakota this week, God. As a body, we stand behind them shoulder to shoulder and arm to arm. And we speak a great harvest in South Dakota, God. We thank you for what you're doing in that land. We thank you for what the prophets have promised in South Dakota. And we thank you that we're seeing it come to pass before our eyes. We thank you that from Kentucky to South Dakota and from South Dakota to the rest of the nation, God, that your spirit is sweeping across this nation. I pray that they have fruitful services, that you give them words as the oracles of heaven, and you give them an increased boldness to declare your word there in Jesus' name. Mighty works they will see in your name in South Dakota this week. We glorify you and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody else got anything? Are we good? Hallelujah. We will see you all Tuesday and Thursday. Well, some of